What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of the Liberty Hangout podcast. My name is Justin. I am the founder of LibertyHangout.org. We are joined today by our co-host, uh, Chris John Cox. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, we got the football game on top here. Uh, I believe right now we have the L.A. Rams game. Um, hopefully in a bit we can get the New England Patriots game up here. And we are honored to be joined today by one of the Liberty Movement's most renowned names in Christopher Cantwell. Christopher Cantwell is the founder of ChristopherCantwell.com, and he is the host of the Radical Agenda podcast. What's going on, Chris? Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, there's uh, certainly uh, a great deal going on, and I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. Now, I know a year ago, uh, we may have a lot of people that are watching this right now that may not have uh, known about Liberty Hangout back in 2015, but um, almost a year to the date, uh, I was making the promo for this. I saw we had him on on November 29th, 2015, and when we had him on last year, uh, we had a really interesting discussion with Mr. Cantwell, and basically what he was saying to us was how the left is our biggest enemy, both um, when it comes to politics and in society in general. And I remember me and my, co- and my co-host James, we were listening to him, and I agreed with a lot of what Chris had to say, but at the same time I scratched my head thinking to myself, Chris, you're saying shut out all leftists? You, you can't just do that. You mean, you mean to tell me we can't reason with them even a little bit? And here we are a year later, and us at Liberty Hangout, um, we're, we're, we're speaking a message you're very... people out of fucking helicopters, <laughs> aren't <you>? <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're speaking a message uh, very similar to Chris here. And so I got to ask you, uh, how does it feel to be vindicated? <laughs> it, is, it is good. I was, uh, I had, it actually, um, I read a piece of yours off the, on the air on my show the other day, and I, and I had pieces. remarked on the show that, uh, that I had been on, yeah, and I had remarked on the show that I had been on with you guys last year, and that, I, like, you, were ha- you weren't putting up much of a, a, a disagreement with me, but I could tell that there was sort of like, a, a, I don't know, I said that I view leftists as vermin generally, they are to be exterminated, and I think there was a bit of discomfort with that at first. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I made these guys uncomfortable, I think. But it seems to me that some time has passed and you're like, oh, yeah, these people really are a goddamn <laughs> infestation and need to be done away with. Now, at the same time, too, you weren't just coming out um, talking about that, talking about right wing populism, but you were one of the first libertarians to support Donald Trump. You really kind of stood alone a year ago. So tell us why you made that decision and Tell us um, how you look back on that decision now, a year later, seeing as how he won the election. Well, I tell you what, it, it, it turned out to be one of the better decisions that I've made. Um, I was I was kind of surprised by it myself because the first thing that I had to say about the Republican primary had nothing positive to say about Donald Trump. The first thing I said was, you know, he's proof that the Republican Party is hopeless. I mean, what do we think is going to happen? This billionaire investor is going to go become president of the United States. He's going to be looking to get a return on his investment is what I'm thinking. And so... Uh, as, but as the primary went forward, I was uh, I was certainly not impressed with Rand Paul, and I and I sort of wanted to do the you know the anarcho capitalist too cool for school. I'm not participating in this election <laughs> stuff, and my soul will be clean, moral, full fucking nonsense. And I but you know as the thing goes forward, ladies and gentlemen, you got to watch when you watch if you pay attention to uh, politics and a presidential election in particular, you get to realizing that. Hey, uh, there's going to be an outcome to this thing, and if you want to have a say in it, you might want to participate. And uh, as time went forward, I realized, like, look, this guy is, uh, uh, you know, he's not he's not Ron Paul, but he's certainly not a foreign policy war hawk. He doesn't want to go out and get himself mixed up into all these things. And when you started looking, um, and I started looking into the immigration issue, I, like a lot of other libertarians, had accepted that open borders was the libertarian position on. Uh, the immigration issue, and you realize that if you if you read some uh, some Hans Hermann Hoppe, some Lou Rockwell, any any number of uh, uh, good right wing libertarian thinkers, uh, you realize that that is absolutely not the case, and that the only thing that could force mass immigration the way that we are suffering through it, the only thing that can possibly do that is the state. And if and if Donald Trump wants to put an end to that government program, which threatens my existence then I think that that's a good policy. And so those are some of the things that got me on board. Looking back on it was the other thing. Looking back on it, uh, one of the best decisions I ever made because it, it allowed me to contact, get into contact with a whole new group, group of people. I'm a pretty well-known figure on the alt right now. And uh, it, 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 I think it was a, a, a way to positively move a conversation forward and affect public policy. Yeah, and I, I think you make a real good point here how looking back a year ago, all of us, ANCAPs in particular, as this election got started, none of us really wanted to participate in the system. We thought it was giving the state legitimacy, but at the end of the day, we have to realize that 
the outcome of the election is going to be forced upon us whether we want to or not. So that's why if we want to shrink the state or at least halt its growth, it's so important for us to get involved and choose who we think is going to do the least damage. Because if someone is going to force upon you the decision to either get a kick in the knee or have a bullet to your face, obviously you're going to choose the kick in the knee. So um, I'm certainly... also, and, and Hillary Clinton would have been would have been a bullet to the face. There's no question about that. Either, OK, <laughs> if anybody's paying, it was so funny to me watching the election. And there's and there's some of the libertarians on Facebook just think they're so like, I don't know, self self congratulating themselves on how such moral victories that they're waging by doing nothing. Right. And so uh, people are trying to act like it does not matter if Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton becomes president of the United States. Like these are the exact same things because there will be initiatory force. It's so short sighted. It shows that they haven't bothered to just take 10 minutes to watch Fox News, much less try to understand the issues. Right. They completely have no idea what they're talking about. So they're just saying there's not a dime's worth of difference between these two people. And I'm like, uh, one wants an open borders hemisphere where 600,000 people could come pouring into. I'm sorry, 600, 600 million people can come pouring into the United States. And the other one wants to build a giant fucking wall. I think that there's a little bit of difference in these two policies. Yeah, that's what I wrote the other day. I mean, it's just completely ignorant to say that one group that completely rejects the concept of self-ownership and property rights uh, can even be compared to a more right-wing candidate. Exactly. And so this is um, you mentioned right wing populism, which is a piece I've read on the air by Murray Rothbard a couple of times. If anybody hasn't read that piece, I'd encourage you to go do it. This is Murray Rothbard talking about David Duke and how the media conspired to I tank his candidacy. If, if, if you don't mind me interjecting real quick, I have a feeling that if people are still for open borders and uh, saw no notable difference between Trump and Clinton, I think there's a good chance that they probably didn't read that piece. Right, exactly. I, I think that it's extraordinarily unlikely that anybody who holds these positions, you know, the open borders thing. I always, I, I said on the other day, and uh, you know, people don't have the time to read Democracy: The God That Failed, cover to cover, which I highly recommend. Hans Hermann Hoppe, excellent book. If you don't have the time to do that, can you just go read Lou Rockwell? Pro- uh, open borders is an assault on private property. Could you do that and then respond to something that Lou said? You know, because I think Lou Rockwell was might be a sort of credible name in libertarianism. He's alive. You can ask him questions and shit like this. Maybe they just go read that essay and it'd take them less than 10 minutes. And I think they'll really have an understanding of it. But they just say you're a statist. <laughs> you're a statist. You're a fascist. <laughs> you're a racist is the only thing you get out of these people. And I'm like, no wonder, you know. That type of conversation, I mean, that's exactly all that Hillary Clinton's campaign was, was calling Donald Trump a racist and a misogynist. And I'm like, you know what? Something tells me that you're trying to avoid dealing with the issue here. Yeah, and I think that maybe that's a good reason for why they turn against people like Stefan Molyneux, too, because there's a famous meme going around with him that says, not an argument, and they don't like that. They can't get away with not making arguments anymore. And I, you mentioned just a couple minutes ago that you said that um, – now that this election season has gone on, you've become a known figure in alt-right circles. So i got to ask you, do you still identify as libertarian or ANCAP, or how would you describe your philosophies now? Well, here's the thing. So I'm a libertarian in the sense that I think that um, uh, the non-aggression principle is a fine gentleman's agreement for all of us to shake hands on and agree to abide by those rules. The fact of the matter is most of mankind does not abide by those rules, and you have to protect yourself against these people. Uh, so I'm, I'm a libertarian in the sense that this is how I think the world should be organized, and I am, uh, find myself in direct conflict with many libertarians because I realize, as all of us should, that it does not organize itself in this way. Uh, you know, right. the alt-right... The alt-right has factions to it, and, I, and it'd be difficult for me to sort of identify all of them. You know, some, some, uh, some people on the alt-right will say that it is an explicitly white nationalist movement, that uh, you know, non-whites are not you know, inclusive or whatever. Um, I would disagree with those people. I think that uh, Vox Day put out a, a piece that was worth taking into consideration, alt-white versus alt-west. <laughs> um, I mean, there are, there are components of it that I agree with. Listen, I think that uh, the white nationalists make a very good case for being white nationalists. They're like, listen, here's the problems in our society, and here are the demographics of those problems. If we remove these demographics, these problems will not happen nearly as frequently. That is an argument that I can't argue against. You know, if you say blacks are committing half the crime in the United States, you want to cut your crime right in half, you get rid of them. It's a, it's, it seems like a true enough statement to me, and uh, I can't tell them, uh, okay, well, I disagree with your premise because you're a racist, because that's not an argument, right? Um, so I, I, I would say 
I'm, I'm an anarcho-capitalist in the sense that uh, if I were made the philosopher king of the universe, then I would organize the world in this way. Um, I am not uh, behaving as an anarcho-capitalist in all instances because uh, in the modern day, it's, just, it's, in, it's in direct contravention of reality. You just can't operate by those rules. So it kind of sounds a lot like you're siding with the alt-right and the nationalists because you feel like this is a good strategy to maybe get us towards an anarcho-capitalist society? Yeah, the idea being, listen, um, the other thing that uh, your, your readers should, uh, your watch viewers or listeners should uh, take a look at is RK selection theory, the, the evolutionary psychology behind politics. I really think that our political problems are, you know, we are, we are biological organisms, gentlemen, okay? So, like, everything that we do has some kind of genetic origin to it, okay? Now, if you have a bunch of people who, over the course of many generations, thousands of years, were bred and raised according to the incentives of the democratic state, well, then it tends to reason that people are going to evolve to be advantageous within the hyper-inclusive mass democracy. If you want to have people who are capable of living without a, a massive central government controlling their every action, you're going to have to have people who are bred for that purpose. And so if you've got a, a, a civilization of welfare-dependent people who are incapable of thinking for themselves, who thinks that calling someone a racist is an argument, these people are incapable of living without somebody having their fucking boot on their neck. So you have to create a society full of people who can live in the absence of the state. And that is something that can be done through government policy, frankly. People act like, uh, oh, it's, it's an initiatory force, therefore it's uh, unlibertarian and I need not entertain it. No. Different outcomes can have uh, – different, different public policies can have different impacts on the, on the people of the society. Look at, look at all this safe space college campus nonsense that's going on. Just eight years of Barack Obama turned everybody into a bunch of sniveling, whining little fucking, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the, the words for that. So uh, <laughs> this is just just uh, just the cultural impact that the president of the United States has. Barack Obama hasn't gotten to pass a whole lot of policy while he's been president. He got he got Obamacare through in the first, um, you know, in the beginning of his first term. And then the Republicans locked him up during the midterms. And he hasn't been able to pass any major, major legislation since. So. The impact that the president of the United States has on the culture is huge. And then if you start actually impacting policy, take, you know, you look at the welfare state. It's a dysgenics program, okay? The welfare state says the people in this country who produce the least, who are the least value to their society, we will keep on putting money in their pockets for every child that pops out of their rancid little cunt in the housing projects, okay? That is incentivizing the genetic population of this society with welfare-dependent people. Well, you can have an opposite policy. You could be like, hey, uh, you want to uh, you you collect welfare, you have to be sterilized, well, that'll that'll have the exact opposite impact, and that will result in a in a different quality of human being living in your civilization. Now, since you said that the president does have a big impact over the culture and the society and and, and what have you, um, I gotta ask: Do you expect Donald Trump to st to um, stick to his campaign promises, or do you think that there's a chance that um, he is the guy that we were scared of a year ago, and he doesn't stick to a single one of his words? Well, I suspect it'll be somewhere in between. Listen, right. Donald Trump can't possibly live up to his campaign promises because one of his campaign promises was, I will never let you down. I can promise you that. <laughs> OK, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard a presidential candidate say. Right. I will never let you down. This I can promise you. Who the fuck in their right mind believes that? Right. It's complete <laughs> bullshit. It's, your job is to fuck people over. <laughs> There's no way that you're not going to screw me. Um, he made a he made a campaign promise that he was going to appoint a special prosecutor to prosecute Hillary Clinton, which I thought was like the greatest thing in the history of democracy. And he's already and, walked that back, apparently. Of course. And, that, and it's good for good reason, too, by the way. Right. He's, he's the president of the United States. If he wants to govern, it might be a better idea to let that go than to start a civil war with the Democrat Party. So he's going to say, all right, I got more important things to do than to lock this asshole up. She's at the end of her fucking rope anyway. Hopefully she dies before my first term. And, you know, maybe he'll have her killed. Who knows? But he's not going to prosecute her. Is, is, I'm fairly confident of this. And I'm already very, very furious about that because I want Hillary Clinton to go and uh, be made somebody's bitch. And if that's not going to happen, then I'm going to be very upset. But, you know, it's the president of the United States. He's fucking me over, shockingly enough. You know, do I think that fucking Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio would have fucked me over too? A lot worse than Donald Trump will. <laughs> and uh, how do you think all these libertarians are going to react <laughs> if he kind of winds up to be no different than Hillary Clinton? I mean, 
obviously right now we got the whole kind of draining the swamp thing going on. Uh, a lot of people are expecting diplomacy with Russia, diplomacy with Syria, but at the same time he's bringing in people um, like there's there's rumors of Rudy Giuliani coming onto his team. Uh, he's got Jeff Sessions coming on. So what if he's really no different than Hillary Clinton? <laughs> Do we lose our credibility? Well, well, if he's no if he's no different than Hillary Clinton, I would say that we've got some very very serious problems right. which need to be solved with gunfire. Um, but I, I think that there will be some difference between him and Hillary Clinton, even if he is going to be a big government establishment hack. Yeah. Listen, here's what I want Donald Trump to do. Here's the singular goal that I want Donald Trump to do. I want him to solidify the power of the Republican Party and crush the Democrats. That's the only thing I care about right now. Listen to me. This this immigration situation is the Democratic Party trying to fill up the country with socialist voters. That's all they're trying to do. And they are willing to create massive amounts of misery and suffering and death and destruction in order to have that happen because they want to solidify their own political power. And that will put an end to white people in the United States. And I'm not a big fan of that idea. So um, if the Republican Party uh, is going to compete with the Democratic Party, then they have to start doing really ruthless, terrible things to stop the Democrats. And I don't I don't care uh, if he has to scare the living shit out of every single one of us. If he brings in Rudy Giuliani and John Bolton and all these people, fine, go ahead, do it. But make policy to uh, to uh, disenfranchise voters, frankly, uh, to, to set fucking voting rights to the Civil War, if we're all I care. And do what you have to do to stop the power of the Democratic Party, because if they're allowed to take power again, gentlemen, we're not going to fucking survive this thing. They'll do anything. There's no code of conduct with the left. They'll destroy us. Now, what would you say to, because um, Chris posted a meme on Liberty Hangout earlier, um, about open borders, libertarians, uh, yeah. and we had a lot of, uh, I don't know if they were Liberty Hangout followers, they probably weren't, they were probably just people that saw it shared in a group and wanted to come troll, because I'm pretty sure that 99% of our followers are right-leaning or constitutional conservatives, so most of them are for closed borders. Uh, would you be able to make the case here to anyone watching that may be for open borders, why that is a very terrible prescription for a libertarian strategy? Okay. Well, strategically speaking, this will result in the end of libertarianism. It will it will be erased from the minds of men and fall into some um, dustbin of history. Uh, but not even that, because in a dustbin, at least somebody could go pull it out. It will cease to exist. The ideas that you hold valuable, the way that you want to organize society, the only way it can happen is if enough people within that society feel the same way as you do. And if you uh, import socialist, communists, and theocrats to replace your people then your people will no longer exist. And the only ideas that will live in that society is socialism, communism, and, and theocracy. If you want to have a libertarian society, well, you might want to start paying attention to demographics, ladies and gentlemen, because you might have noticed if you've been to a libertarian event or two that you're, you're surrounded by mostly white males. And uh, that, that is something that has caused us to be mocked and derided. Uh, the, um, what's his name? McAfee over at the Libertarian Party convention. He, he looked out at the audience. He said, most of you are white. And most of you are male. You should be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> well, no, as a matter of fact, you fucking asshole. I'm not ashamed to be a, a, a white male. As a matter of fact, white males have accomplished some of the greatest things in the history of mankind. And I, and I kind of like feel pretty good about being that. And so if libertarians are largely comprised of white males and white males just happen to have created the most stable governments, mo largest militaries, best businesses in the history of mankind, then I'm not surprised that we figured out the answer to our political problems either. All right. So uh, if you have these, if you get on board with the left and they're like, well, you know, all you white people, all of you, you, you terrible white males are just dominating the civilization. It's white supremacy. We've got to demographically destroy you through immigration policy. Uh, that's not going to pan out very well for libertarians who are mostly white males. So that strategically is completely it's a non it's a non starter. You can't even begin to try to pursue your ideas this way. Um, now, if people are not trying to think strategically, if they're not thinking two steps ahead of themselves, then they're probably trying to make some kind of oral argument about it. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you think of um, private property, private property owners do not generally give their property out to the general public to be trampled upon and used without cost. That's not how property owners usually treat their property. So when you're talking about the United States having borders, these essentially common spaces, the United States government has a, an ob obligation to do something with those op open spaces, okay? Now, it, it, there's a lot of people on the left who assume that anything that's government property, well, the government's claim is illegitimate because everything the government has is predicated on initiatory violence. All right, true enough. But that does not mean it does not follow from there that in the absence of state uh, control, that these common spaces, these plots of land 
would simply be remain unowned and exploited by all simultaneously without conflict. That's impossible. Two people cannot right, occupy the same space. Because we have to understand that if all if all of this land were privatized, what private landowner is just going to let every single person in the universe come through their property? They're going to have the incentive to thwart off any threats and let people come in that are going to um, bring them a profit. Yeah. And this is this going over the immigration thing has really changed my worldview a great deal. And it's caused me to become you might not be able to tell by watching my show, but it's caused me to calm down a little bit because <laughs> prior to this, I just looked at the world as just like horrible, scary place where there was this monster on every corner and his name was the state. This is how I've, 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 I've I'm ginning up the title here, but I've been thinking about putting something out titled how I learned to stop worrying and love the state <laughs> because. <laughs> Literally, that's what it is. You're, what I'm saying, what I'm saying about basically all government policy at this point is the government should behave as a market actor. Okay, the government should try to organize itself in such a fashion that it behaves as a market actor would act. And so the idea, as we said, that they would have these open spaces, these plots of land, and that just you know hundreds of thousands, millions of people from third world war torn shitholes just get to come across and collect free cash. Like no, no market actor behaves in this way. So if the government is going to uh, occupy these spaces and getting them to privatize these spaces is not on my list of options. My second favorite option is for the government to behave as a market actor, and that is to say that they would uh, they would be good stewards of property. I know that that's ridiculous, you know, it's, but you know we can yeah. try we can we can try to make these demands and say, okay, well, uh, if you uh, have these uh, these borders, these common spaces, these open spaces, and you're not going to allow us to homestead them, then perhaps you could stop the fucking invasion of my country. <laughs> Yeah, and you you would think that this would be the linchpin of libertarian strategy here is decentralization. Yet you have all these left libertarians that seem to think that letting in all these all these hordes of communists into this country that are going to come here and violate our property rights, they somehow think that that is libertarian. Like the libertarians that support closed borders are not pointing and saying that closed borders are in and of themselves libertarian. We're saying that the only libertarian thing is private borders. What we're saying is that in order to get to a society where this property can be privatized, we have to decentralize and choose a strategy that is going to emit the lesser damage here. So we're not calling closed borders libertarian, but the open borders libertarians are calling open borders libertarian. And I find it kind of strange that an open borders libertarian will never say why open borders are libertarian. They will only make a case for why closed borders aren't. You'll never hear an open borders well, libertarian they, say they why do. it's. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. <clears throat> they they do they do say why, and they essentially the argument is, um, or if you can call it an argument, they'll say um, it's it's you're like trying to punish someone for changing addresses, which is completely nonsense. Um, you're not trying to punish them for changing addresses. You're trying to prevent a demographic which we can observe uh, has a massively high welfare consumption from stealing more yeah. of your income. And you can analogize. So it is self-defense, and that's completely within the defensive you know, um, clause of the yeah. non-aggression principle, in my opinion. Yeah, and you, you can analogize that to some criminal who's in a gang. If he moves into the house next door to you, are you not going to be worried? Um, if he starts making threats that he's going to take over your backyard and steal your living room, are you not going to be worried? Because that's what happens when you have all these communists coming into this country. Well, exactly. And the, and the thing that you have these conversations, one of the most valuable things about this I've found is that it's like um, it's like an integrity barometer. OK, uh, when I when I talk to people and I'm like, OK, here is the most here is the most obvious thing in the world that this is going to get your your entire way of life destroyed. Do you continue with it and call it libertarianism? Right. And if they do, like, I'm like, I'm punching out, pal. You know, I can't I can't do that for very long with them. I'm like, I will try for uh, I'll get, make a token effort to see if you're even processing the information that's being handed to you. And ninety nine point nine percent of the times they're not. Go try to talk to them about, um, you know, any any number of these, you know, special left wing causes. Remember the gay marriage thing in the Ober the Obergefell case that they cramped gay marriage down the throats of all 50 states and locked up this Kim Davis, this elected Democrat county clerk in Kentucky. You remember the story? Oh, yeah, we oh, of course. And all these people are running around changing their pictures to rainbow flags. I, I saw one guy who was 
competing to, who, who wanted to be Libertarian Party's uh, candidate for the United States uh, presidency, and I forget his name off the top of my head. And he went, he, he, he posted a picture of the White House all lit up with rainbow lights on it. And he says, congratulations, Mr. President, we've saved the gay people. And I'm like, you know what, as a matter of fact, this is a giant government program, and I don't think Libertarians should be cheering for it. They jump on board with their left-wing social causes without any regard for what's actually going to happen. And if people are doing that, that's why they can't be negotiated with in good faith. Yeah, and that, that's one of the points that I made in my article about how libertarians have nothing in common with leftists is that our philosophies are so diametri diametrically opposed um, that you have libertarianism premised around the idea of protecting private property, whereas leftism, all their philosophies are hinged on the idea of destroying private property. And then at the same time, you have the libertarians that say, well, you know, what? we can meet them in the middle on certain single issues. You know, we got the drug war, we got gay marriage. Um, abortion no. but when it comes to all these issues they are pro state on all these issues for when it comes to the drug war um first of all i've never seen a, a leftist want to legalize anything outside of pot um good luck trying to get them tell to tell an audience of evangelicals that we should decriminalize heroin like ron paul did and get them to cheer um <laughs> but yeah they I, I never see them want to legalize anything outside of pot and their argument for that is to get the state more tax revenue and regulatory powers. Um, we see something like Arizona where they had on the ballot this year. And um, I believe that on the ballot to vote for it, um, if they would have legalized pot, it would get this, it would get the state of Arizona, a new police force. Now that, that's not very <laughs> libertarian, is it guys? <laughs> and then you have yeah, something the, like the gay marijuana marriage. thing. is a lot of, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you chime in, in a second, but then you see something like gay marriage too. Um, they're for state sanctioned gay marriage. They want the state involved in every single marriage. Um, they're not for private contracts like libertarians are, you know, we want the state out of marriage. It's not a victory to cheer the government, um, getting more involved in something. And then something like abortion, um, I mean, I'm pro-life, so I'll make the argument that you don't have the right to an abortion, but their argument is that it should be state-funded. So there's yeah. really nothing that we have uh, common ground with. I'm not even going to entertain the thought of them being anti-war because I haven't seen an anti-war Democrat since the Bush days. Uh, go ahead, Chris. You wanted to make your point about well, you know, in, uh, in fairness, thing. I mean, if you to, if you look at like Code Pink and these you know left wing radicals who are not uh, slaves of the Democratic Party, I mean, these people are anti war. I'll give them that much. I'll, I'll grant them this. But everything, it, like even when it, even when a leftist comes up with what sounds like a good idea, the reasoning that got him there makes him dangerous. Okay, yeah. so you know the, the Code Pink leftist anti warrior people, you know, they haven't. They, they certainly stepped down their anti-war efforts after the Bush administration, shall we say. Right? They weren't as antagonistic to Barack Obama as they had been to George W. Bush, but they did antagonize him. I, I just I have to give them this much. But what it is is they're like, don't spend that money on war. Spend it on huge social welfare programs here at home. I mean, that's their entire you know thought process. Like oh, Jill all Stein. of this could be... All of this could be fucking redistributed so splendidly and leave us with squat instead of going and, you know, killing all these people somewhere. And uh, I can understand why somebody might feel that way, that that was a better expenditure of resources. Um, but it's 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 always it's always that they want to do something even more horrific. I mean, if you if you give me a choice, gentlemen, between a, a, a war and a new social welfare program, I will choose the war. And, and I will do so on entirely libertarian grounds that it's going to cause a lot less destruction than the social welfare program because wars have this nasty habit of ending, whereas social welfare programs know no such thing. I think it was Ronald Reagan said, uh, I just want to play devil. You come to it. I just, want to play, I just want to play devil's advocate here because Murray Rothbard talked about how war was the health of the state and how nothing perpetuates these social welfare programs quite like that because it creates yeah. all these Keynesian jobs programs. Um, you look at World and War I II. Wanted to, uh, I wanted to chime in there. Um, wars are actually more likely to end under Republicans because the Republicans like Bush actually go into the war with an exit strategy. Um, and they go into them with, you know, like uh, actually controlled Congress mm. that Bush went into Iraq with. So they actually had a good plan to get out. The leftists, they actually tend to go into war and major wars at that and continue them for a very long time. And the consequences of that war tend to be refugees, which help the left. So I'd say that leftists are actually, you know, when you get down to it, that's one of their best strategies to get more votes and more social welfare programs. So you get the war and the social welfare programs instead of just the war. 
Right. I, I should I should clarify that up uh, that what I uh, the hypothetical situation I put forward was if I get to choose between a war and a social welfare program, I'll choose the war. You're absolutely correct in that these things usually tend to come hand in hand and vice versa as well, of course, because when governments run their massive social welfare programs, they run themselves into debts. And then they do horrible, crazy, lunatic things on the world stage to try to distract you from the fact that your economy is fucked. So, uh, yeah, I understand that these two, two things do sort of go hand in hand. But, you know, one of the things I've liked about dealing with people on the alt right has been interesting is that there's a lot more anti-war sentiment amongst them than there is amongst our, uh, our left-wing counterparts, that these people are, like, vehemently anti-war for the most part. Now, might, they might say, okay, fine, now we've got ourselves in this conflict and there's ISIS or whatever, and so Donald Trump should go in and kill all these people and then stop. But generally speaking, they're not fans of, like, the Bush foreign policy doctrine, regime change, and going in and invading all these countries and that sort of thing. And it's been interesting to be able to have uh, more, like, serious policy discussions with them, right? I, a lot of us in libertarian circles... We'll, we'll punch out a policy. We'll just punch out a policy in, in electoral politics and say, like, oh, we all need to, uh, I don't know, love each other more or some shit and just to try to, you know, pray away the goddamn state. Um, and going into it and trying to deal with people who are like, no, here's the outcome I want to achieve. Let's discuss what will actually achieve that outcome. It's been a really uh, fun experience. Yeah, now, now Chris J., uh, he just made a really good point when he was talking about how the Democrats, they go into these wars because it creates refugees, which creates a lot of people to come here uh, to come onto their social welfare programs. And I think that's something that a lot of the left libertarians never take into consideration uh, when they advocate for open borders. Um, they're big. They, they talk a lot about blowback, how if you go into these countries and you bomb people, it's going to make a lot of people hate your country, yet they can't really put two and two together and realize that, well, if you have open borders and you're going to go bomb people and make them hate your country, that you're going to have a lot of people that hate your country coming over your borders. Yeah, I thought it was so funny watching, um, you know, when the, when the whole Syrian refugee thing first became a big news story. I saw there was a Jeffrey Tucker meme of him smiling with a little speech bubble that said, more Syrians, please. <laughs> I'm like, really like, you want to tell me this is this is literally when we're talking about the Syrian refugees. These are people who are being relocated here at taxpayer expense that literally they could be put off in like a safe zone somewhere in Syria and be amongst their own people and have everything that they need for a, for, for a tenth of the cost of what it costs to bring them here at taxpayer expense. And this guy who's calling all of us status for observing things about demographics, it's like, Please do more of that. Please have the United States federal government pick the pockets of every man, woman, and child, some not even yet born in this country, and use that money to import a bunch of people who we've been bombing, who I told you would want to kill us as a result of that. And I don't think there's any problem with that whatsoever. I think that these people are not thinking it through all the way. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at this, if we break it down exactly, what is war? Um, war is a government program. They, they tax you to go into it. Um, wars cost trillions and trillions of dollars and then it displaces people. You get all these refugees that hate your country and then the government has to tax people again to deal with the borders and then they're taxing you a third time to pay for all these refugees. So it's just taxes on top of taxes and yet you have the left libertarians calling you a statist if you somehow oppose this. Yeah, this is why, and I mean, <clears throat> honestly, I, I have, um, I, I, I keep, I've, I've been waiting to put this out for like three weeks now, and I keep on uh, waiting because information keeps on changing. But I've been putting together a piece on libertarians and the alt right. I know other people have done this. Um, but I, I think that, uh, I'm sorry, you know, the point that I was trying to get at was uh, um, a lot of the people on the alt right, if you talk to them, a lot of them identify as former anarcho capitalists, and, and they hide their identities in most cases because there's, you know, things that are commonly deemed racist being discussed, and that's a good way to get your career ended. But a lot of these people are former libertarians who bought into uh, the sort of like Jeffrey Tucker Center for a Stateless Society line on what libertarianism means. And they went over to the alt-right and they were like, libertarianism is stupid because I agree with Kathy Reisenwitz, right? And I'm like, I've, I've been saying this for years, that like you've got these leftist infiltrators inside a libertarian movement who are completely fucking detached from reality. Um, and they are turning people off. They talk about us, you know, turning people off with our backwards, sexist, slut-shaming views or whatever. And uh, the truth of the matter is, is that they created an entire fucking movement of right wing extremists who are trying to chuck leftists out of helicopters. Yeah. This is what they, the fucking we, result of their actions are. Because we always talk on Backwards Live. We talk about libertarian strategy and marketing a lot. And what I like to bring up is how when it comes to marketing, you have to know your current consumers and you have to know your target demographics. So if it comes to libertarianism, uh, what I see is that our target demographic should be right wing conservatives because we share a lot of the same um 
principles, albeit they haven't taken it to the same rational conclusions, um, because they say they support things like capitalism, self-defense, uh, self-ownership, decentralization. Uh, they support protecting private property rights, uh, things like that. They're the only other people that will share taxation stuff memes, and we share the same vocabulary with them. As I like to say, you can get a Republican to click on a page called Liberty Hangout because they'll see the word liberty, but good luck trying to get a leftist to click like on a page that says liberty. So that's why I feel yeah. that the target market should be the conservatives, and your current consumers are the libertarians. So once you start speaking as a left libertarian, well, you're going to tick off your current consumers, and you're going to tick off who should be your target demographic. So what you're left with is all your current consumers are not going to want anything to do with you. The people you should be bringing into the movement are going to want nothing to do with you. And then the leftists already want nothing to do with you because they see libertarianism as being too radical no matter how much you water down the message. And this is – the proof in the pudding is from Gary Johnson's campaign where you had all the leftists he tried to court in. They're blaming him for Hillary Clinton winning, and you had Bernie Sanders and all his supporters running around calling Gary Johnson too much of a radical when all us libertarians were calling him too much of a statist. Yeah, it's completely ridiculous to try to watch these people. You can just imagine what their existence is like. Like, it's got to be like a scene out of They Live. You know that movie where he puts on the glasses? You know what I'm talking about? You get yeah. that reference? So. <laughs> They see Liberty Hangout, right? And they put their little leftist glasses on, and all they see is racist hangout, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they say, freedom, and they're like, misogynist hangout, this is terrible. We've it's funny, you should, it's it funny you should say that, because someone just commented conservative hangout. <laughs> that's that's there not, that's not yeah. an argument. <laughs> yeah, they see, they see freedom, liberty, choice, and it's just like racism, misogyny, homophobia. That's all they can see. Everything in their world is, is put through these ridiculous uh, lenses. You look like you had a point there, Chris. You didn't hear me? Other Chris. Oh no, he's he's oh. um <laughs> he's he's talking to me. I actually wanted to ask you when you came on here. Um and I know I know you did this uh back in the day. Um if you were ever considering running for office, like even like local elections like for city council or county supervisor, if you'd recommend anyone else should do that. Well, let me let me put it this way. Um, there are people in New Hampshire who ask me to do this uh, from time to time, and I will acknowledge that uh, taking a a shift rightward politically is advantageous in that, right? Um, and so uh, this idea does cross my mind from time to time. But frankly, I'm a guy who can't leave his house without a firearm without worrying about getting himself shot. So I think I'm terribly unlikely to win a popularity contest in the near future. And thus, probably electoral politics is not the bit for me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are at home and you are not hated by your community, if you're actually pretty well liked and you got a few bucks, then you might be able to wield political power and crush your fucking enemies and solve a problem or two. And in that case, yeah, you should run for office. Right. Um, I was I was thinking that um, during the election, uh, it might be more advantageous in some ways to run as a libertarian because you now have these people who are Republicans who don't like Trump who might be considering running as a libertarian. But on the opposite, you know, and you might be able to run as a Republican still because they are the dominant office and they might be able to win more local elections than the Democrats would. Well, here's the, here's the thing about that. All right. If you want to run as a protest vote, let me tell you, when I ran for Congress in 2010, I did this in New York already. When I ran for Congress in 2010, I had originally intended to try to run with New York has uh, cross endorsement. So you can be two parties at the same time. So I ran on the libertarian line. I was going to try to get it on the Republican line. We didn't even we ended up not even bothering to try to get the signatures for the Republican line because we were having enough trouble getting signatures for the libertarian line. And what ended up happening was the guy who won the Republican primary really did not have a I know we were just mocking people who thought this about Clinton and Trump, but literally you, we, we know anybody who po follows politics, you see these elections come around from time to time where there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Republican and the Democrat. Now, I ran as a libertarian. I didn't even make the ballot. But I went out there and I railed against the Republican. I said, this is not smaller government. This guy is not what we're trying to fight for. I mean, I was running around with the Tea Party and they got this like big government establishment hack who was like carpet bagging and trying to go buy a congressional district. And I was furious about it. And I went and I shit mouthed him all over the place. And he ended up losing the election by less than 100 votes. All right. Um, I wasn't even on the ballot, so we, we didn't get to count how many people wrote me in or whatever, but a, a number of people did contact me, and I spoke to thousands of people about my candidacy, and it's entirely possible, that, even likely perhaps, that I costed that Republican candidate the election. Now, honestly, if somebody did that in this year, I don't want to break their fucking neck. I want the Republican Party to maintain control of the House and Senate. 
However, mm-hmm. uh, if you really have one of these instances where you, you, you might be able to uh, correct the behaviors of your Republican establishment, then perhaps that is useful as a libertarian candidate. And running in a libertarian party, also, mind you, uh, gives you the advantage of – like you have a psychological impact when you go up to somebody and you say, hello, my name is Christopher Cantwell and I'm running for Congress. They're like, oh, that's a reason to listen to you. You know, If you're just like, hi, my name is Christopher Cantwell and I have a camera and I want to put you on YouTube, they're like, fuck off, asshole. I don't want to play. But if you go and you say I'm a congressional candidate, they're like, oh, you might be my ruler. I should inquire as to your opinions. <laughs> you know, And so it gives them a reason to talk to you. And in that sense, you can spread a message by being a Libertarian Party candidate. Now, uh, I would warn you that if you have any intention of trying to actually be involved in politics, if you would actually like to hold office at some point, running for office as a Libertarian is not a good strategy to set you down that path. Because if you get, uh, uh, if you will, typecasted, as a protest vote, if you get yourself uh, stereotyped as a guy who does not w- run to win the election, then you will not win elections. That the Republican Party will resist you if you attempt to uh, run for office on their line because they'll see you as throwing away the election for your own aggrandizement. And there is a very good reason for them to do that because, as we've seen just with this presidential election, some of these things are very consequential. So that leads into a very good question that I want to ask you. What are your thoughts on the campaign that Gary Johnson and Bill Weld ran this year? And what are your thoughts on oh. the, what are your thoughts on the future of the Libertarian Party? Oh, uh, I, honestly, I haven't paid a great deal of attention to Gary Johnson this election season. I think he was completely irrelevant. Uh, you know, what is Aleppo? <laughs> and I can't think of a single world stage leader to talk about in a foreign policy discussion with CNN. Like, get the fuck out of here. We, you should have been able to get through the, the debate process. And then all the things that led up to it, I hear that there was, uh, you know, acu- uh, accusations of some, you know, uh, collusion or bribing to get him the nomination to begin with. And but what jo- Gary Johnson, I, I, I really can't claim to have followed the campaign very closely. But here's my problem with Gary Johnson. He is emblematic of everything that's wrong with the libertarian movement, because as far as he's concerned, libertarianism is about marijuana and anal sex. And I really don't have any fucking sympathy for this whatsoever. Like there are very serious problems going on in our society, and I want to see them solved. And if Gary Johnson thinks the bigger problem that we have is that transgender people can't fucking go into a bathroom that doesn't match the fucking shit between their legs. Oh, his, his biggest his people, biggest problem was that they couldn't go into a bakery and get a pa- and, and, and get a uh, cake. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you what. I would have loved the Gary Johnson presidency because I couldn't wait to walk into a Jew bakery and tell them to bake me a fucking <laughs> swastika cake. That would have been fantastic. I know, other than that, it would have been a disaster. Now, what are your thoughts, um, since obviously you do have a little bit of issues with Gary Johnson because you think he's everything that's wrong with the libertarian movement, um, do you think that they would have been better off with a more libertarian candidate? I mean, I know you have your qualms with Austin Peterson. Do you think that it would have been a smarter move for the delegates to have chosen someone like him this year? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm tempted to say that, but I'm just really trying to picture as it went forward how badly Austin Peterson could have gone off the rails, right? Um, Austin Peterson presents himself well, and I believe that he probably has a lot more knowledge of the issues than does Gary Johnson, and so he probably would have been a better candidate. And and the reason that uh, Chris and I supported him in the primary was that he was bringing in the right people. He was bringing in a bunch of the conservatives, and in these libertarian debates, he was talking a lot like Ron Paul, talking about – talking about uh, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and he sounded very much like an ANCAP. He was talking about how the biggest threat to... I remember in one of the debates, it was on on The Blaze, hosted by Penn Jillette. Um, The candidates were asked, who's the greatest threat to our liberty and to our national security? Austin Peterson said, the U.S. federal government. The question was passed to Gary Johnson. He said, North Korea. He has no idea what he's talking about. Like, like North Korea being like a military problem for America. Fuck off. You know, no wonder you don't know where Aleppo is. Yeah, that was that was the primary concern you hear from these undecided voters. Um, you know, during the election, is as soon as he made that Aleppo gap, you hear everyone that you know because I worked in local elections, and whenever I happened to ask someone what they thought of the Libertarian ticket, they'd always tell me, "Your candidate doesn't know anything about foreign policy," and that scares me. Well, you know what? Um, I want to I want to rewind a little bit here and just say, thinking about the consequences of Austin Peterson gaining the Libertarian nomination, I actually think might not have been good. It would have been good for the Libertarian Party because they might have gotten more votes. I think that Austin Peterson could have done a good job of um, uh, reeling in these anti-Trumpers, right? The Never Trump people, and that he probably could have done better in that case than um, uh, Eric McMullen, I believe his name was the the Evan Goldman McMullen, Sachs yeah. CIA Evan McMullen. That's what it is. Uh, the uh, Goldman Sachs CIA hack who thought it would be a really good idea to try to wrestle the, the electoral votes out of Donald Trump's hands. Um, he probably, I think he could have probably done better than that guy even. However, 
Uh, that would not have panned out very well for you and me, my friend. That would have t- turned out very bad. So do because you think he could have cost Trump the election? He, he possibly could have. I think that he would have, he would have had a, 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 a more negative impact on Trump than Gary Johnson did, right? Because mm-hmm. Johnson, the, as much as I don't like what he was doing, I don't like the ideas that he was spreading. It was probably good for America and the world and the human race uh, that, that he went out and was a leftist idiot, right? Mm-hmm. Because then, like, disenfranchised Hillary Clinton voters, people who were supporting Bernie Sanders, you know, he did, he did better than Jill Stein amongst those people, I think. And so that was, that was pretty significant. Imagine Austin Peterson goes in, and Austin Peterson's talking like a right-wing libertarian, and everybody's like, oh, this is fantastic. I think I want to know more about the Libertarian Party now because I don't like this Donald Trump guy very much. He seems like a kind of a big government guy. I'm going to go vote for Gary Johnson. Then Hillary Clinton becomes president of the United States, and you and I got to die in a civil war. Now, what do you think about uh, the other part of the question I asked before? What do you think about the future of the Libertarian Party is going forward? Do you think they're going to take a more leftist approach? Or do you think that they will maybe wake up and see some common sense and see uh, that right-wing populism is something that's in? Trump won the election. The GOP won the House and Senate. They they control the majority of state legislators. So do you think maybe they'll wise up here and come to reason? Or are they, or are they going to continue trying to court uh, disaffected communists? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to suspect and hope that they don't come around to the right way of thinking. Because as much as I wish the Libertarian Party was spreading good ideas instead of, you know, transgender weed nonsense, uh, the the fact of the matter is, is that the impact that they will have on our elections if they are running right-wing candidates is they will give the country to the Democratic Party. And that is something that cannot be done. We cannot allow that to happen. That is absolutely a non-starter for Libertarians. What if they have to stop the Democratic Party? Just to play devil's advocate again, what if they do manage to start winning local elections? Well, if they if they start to win local elections and they're running leftists, then you know that's a pretty big problem in and of itself, right? right. And then if well, it, well, what, and that what, would what be a case where the right Libertarian libertarians. Party actually had power, yeah. though, right? So then, <laughs> then we're talking about a scenario where the Libertarian Party has power, and then that is going to be a, a complete strategic dynamic change for for us, right? If you're yeah. trying to, if you're trying to influence the outcome of our society, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. One is electoral politics, and the other is shooting people in the fucking face. All right, those are your two options. You want to start changing the government around. Now, most of the people I talk to, not big fans of like uh, warfare in the streets, and so this is probably going to be done mostly through electoral politics. Let's just deal with that reality. Um, and so, if the Libertarian Party starts winning. Uh, local elections and that sort of thing. Well, you know, believe me, I think it's better than the Greens winning it. <laughs> that's that's certainly a good thing. If they started running white right wing candidates and winning those offices, well, and they would not be uh, necessarily competing with the uh, Republicans. They'd probably be to the right of the Republicans, at least on economics and that sort of thing. And so I, I think that that could be good. I just think it's exceedingly unlikely that the Libertarian Party has been around for, what, 40-something years now. And the idea that they're going to mm-hmm. all of a sudden, just because people don't like Donald Trump, like they, like, they, like they weren't so upset with George Bush that they were going to flee the Republican Party, but they're that upset with Donald Trump. I just I don't fucking think it's incredible. Right. So since we've covered the Republicans and the Libertarians, what do you think is the future of the Democrats? Because they seem to be having somewhat of a civil war. Their candidates don't get elected anymore. Um, The candidates they do elect are old, corrupt white people, which is something that their base really doesn't like. Do you think they're going to be a major threat? They they, they don't um, care. In the future, or do you think they're kind of slowly dying out? They don't care if they're old white people as long as it's their party doing it, Chris. Look at the oh, the, that's well, true. the Republicans had uh, a black doctor running. They had a couple of Hispanics running. They had women running, and the Democrats had two old white people. <laughs> yeah, but I want to I want to hear what Chris has to say about this. Here's, here's here's what I hope is the future of the Democratic Party: mass graves. And I'm not even kidding. I hope it's mass graves. If I was if I was Donald Trump right now, I'd sign an executive order. I want the fucking voter rolls and everybody who's a registered Democrat march them off to the fucking gas chambers. I'm not kidding. I can't allow these people to control the government anymore. However, that's pretty unlikely to happen. So let's think about what, what might actually occur. Uh, I suspect that the Democrats will be trying everything in their power to take over the House come 2018. All right. I, I sincerely hope that they fail in this because their strategy is already evident. They, they are not changing course. Everything that's coming out of the New York Times and MSNBC and every liberal journalist is – Donald Trump is a racist. Donald Trump is a racist. And they want to hammer that home for the next two years and hope that it grants them control of the United States House of Representatives. That has to be stopped from happening. Now, uh, if that is stopped from happening, then they will change course because they're not going to lose two elections in a row and not and not take a look at themselves. What I think will be hilarious is 
they will come to the conclusion because these people are very simple minded. You might have gathered. Uh, they will come to the conclusion that the, their problem is that they're alienating whites because everything with them is, uh, you know, demographics and identity politics, at which point they'll start doing things that, uh, you know, that if they had done them now or if a Republican had done them, they would certainly call racist. They would start trying to implement pro white policies. They would start trying to implement pro I don't know, religious people policies or whatever. They're going to start trying to mimic things in order to court favor with uh, with the more mainstream America. So do you think we could see potentially more candidates like uh, the Bill Clinton of the 90s instead of Bernie Sanders if they lose the 2018 elections? Only if they lose in 2018. If they gain anything in 2018, this is going to continue for a long time. Yeah, and I, I think that's to be seen based on the behavior of how the Republicans are going to act. Um I think that if they don't stick to I, I made a video I put on Liberty Hangout yesterday. I said, if you want Donald Trump to make America great again, you as his voters need to hold him accountable for the next four years. Otherwise, you're going to see the Democrats come right back into power. So if he does go off the rails, if the GOP doesn't do what they were just elected to do and repeal Obamacare, cut taxes, um, knowing what we know about the incentives of the state, it's probably going to be very unlikely, which is why. Everyone that voted for these guys, you got to hold their feet to the fire. Otherwise, you're going to see the Democrats march right back into power. Well, if these guys do what they said they were going to do, the Democrats are still going to try to march in and keep power. OK, right. and the other thing that we, this is what we this is this is the danger of Donald Trump, really, is that it, the Republican Party is fractured. And there are people, the Bill Crystals and the weekly standards of the world are going to be working to undermine his presidency. And uh, people on the right, people in the Republican Party have to keep that in mind, that these people are hostile actors and they are not friends of freedom. Uh, those those people are the the, the Bush era uh, type of foreign policy hawks who want to who want America to be like that. And we don't want that. So uh, it's got to be kept an eye on who's undermining him within the Republican Party. And I really hope and that come 2018, there's a few Republican primaries that are heavily funded by Donald Trump. OK, because he's got to maintain he's got to he's got to solidify this factional control over the Republican Party. Also, go ahead, Chris. Um, so, so let's, let's say best case scenario, Republicans maintain control of the House, um, the presidency, all this, um, and the economy starts improving. Um, do you think that uh, once people actually see that there's more prosperity and they're getting jobs and their taxes are lowered, um, do you see people actually saying, like what happened with Reagan, hey, this guy is actually improving the economy after – um, you know, however many years of Jimmy Carter where there's inflation and un unemployment, could there possibly be another landslide um, election for the right in this country? It could be. But here's the thing. They missed it. I, I kind of doubt that there will be. And here's why. Because the media will tout that the improvements in the economy are the, the late coming effects of Barack Obama's second term. Okay, oh, that's, 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 true. that's how it will be painted. So everything, that ha everything good that happens under Donald Trump will be credited to Barack Obama, and everything bad that happens under Donald Trump, Barack Obama will remain blameless. This is how these people will operate because there's no <laughs> effort to try to be honest yeah. about it. They're going to lie to everybody. And so everybody who gets their news from a television set is going to be completely convinced of this falsehood. Uh, and that is what, I mean, if you looked at the election this year, <clears throat> How dramatically different the reporting was from the outcome. You know, if you looked at anything other than Fox News, and even Fox News was was definitely downplaying the, any possibility of a of a Trump victory, but just not as bad as MSNBC. But if you were watching any type of mainstream news source, if you're reading your newspapers, generally speaking, you were getting information that said Donald Trump was getting trounced, that this was not even a close call, that there was no point in going to the I think, polls. I, I think the polls had him behind by like uh, double digits just a week before. Exactly, with the exception of like L.A. Times, I think had a had a more honest one. But then you found out what they were doing—that they were waiting the polls, that they go and give Democrats a nine-point advantage in a district where they do not factually have one. You know, and the, and then when they're polling the independents, they were saying that they were they were purposely uh, polling uh, Hispanics and Native Americans as opposed to whites. Well, if you know that the Republican Party, and it's so funny they won't deal with demographics. There was a big stir, a big uh, controversy that um, uh, uh, someone had taken a picture of the Republican Party gathering after the election or something, and it was all white people, men and women. And like this went around. It's like, look, this is what's wrong with the Republican Party. It's a bunch of white people. Meh. And I'm like, you know, uh, if, if you, they, they make these demographic problems out of it. It's so ridiculous. Now, someone had wrote someone wrote in the comments uh, they want us to ask a question that we may or may not have asked you a year ago I can't remember uh, but they want to know your thoughts on secession and something that I'll add in too is what are your thoughts on all these leftists in California that want to secede well look um, when you talk to leftists about secession what they usually say to us 
You're is racist. the Civil War solved yeah. that question? <laughs> is the Civil War solved that question? So if California wants to exit the Union, I think that there should be a Civil War, and I think that we should kill a lot of them, and then we should win the Civil War, and then we should let them go peacefully. <laughs> That's what I honestly that's what I think should happen to California. And I want them to take all 55 of their electoral votes with them and do away with the Democratic Party's control over the United States uh, but federal government. If if you go in and you kill a lot of the leftists, um, hey, but, what's but, going but, to but happen to Chris Jay is out in California. That means. Yeah. OK. <laughs> who's so who's going to spare I, his life? I personally, I'd want some time to leave this place <laughs> before that happens. But um, secondly, if you go in and kill the leftists, the chances are that this state's going to become more right wing. And in that case, you know, why not just bring it back in? Um, but if you are going to let it leave, you should let it leave with a leftist in. So it will turn into a massive shithole and everyone can look at it and know, OK, this is what happens when the leftists and the Democrats let, let them become another Venezuela state. Yeah, just let them become that. And everyone can point and laugh at them. I think that'd be a more valuable strategy. Well, I don't know. I see and a great then, deal of value in killing communists. I don't know. It just, it just sounds so fucking appealing Why to me. Why not just let yeah, them but, do but, it but themselves? Chris, you know, yeah, that if, seems like a valuable strategy if we let, to me. If we let them peacefully go, then you can sit on your couch in New Hampshire watching on your television set all these hipsters from the University of Cal Berkeley have to flee in the Pacific Ocean in boats made out of trucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's possible. But the other the other possibility is that they uh, do a great deal of uh, lobbying that uh, all of our, uh, I don't know, that all of our carbon output is really causing California to be in very great poverty and that we have to give them foreign aid packages. <laughs> and unfortunately, as long as you've got Bill Crystals and stuff dealing with the Republican Party, that, that might actually go over. That's a very, very good point. I didn't think of that. They, they, they have an excuse to blame the right for everything. If it's not you gun just, violence, it's climate that's change. Why, because, it's, because if you I, have I know an opportunity that... to put leftists in mass graves, you don't pass it up, Joe. <laughs> I know, that, I know yeah. that when Rand Paul was running, um, I was against him for the longest time, as were a lot of libertarians, because there was a period where he was speaking a message I was very unlibertarian, but to Rand Paul's credit, at least he wasn't going around calling himself a libertarian. He never said, guys, I'm a libertarian. He called himself a conservative. So I think that's why people started to warm up to him during the, the, during, uh, the debates. Um, but what a lot of people were saying is that they feared Rand Paul getting into office because once this inevitable economic collapse would happen, oh, all the leftists will blame it on capitalism. But the more you think about it is they're going to blame it on capitalism whether you have a communist in office or a capitalist. Yeah, if Bernie Sanders became president of the United States and and and, 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 uh, and a into, constitutional into amendment, <laughs> right? If, if if Bernie Sanders had a constitutional amendment written that it, that said the United States shall have a democrat socialist economy, <laughs> people would blame capitalism for all the problems that resulted from that. These people, this is why this is why I this is why I get to a point like I said, oh, you you want to succeed fine, can we kill as many of you as we can like mass graves, all these terrible things that I'm saying about these people because you can't have an honest conversation with them. It's not <laughs> It's not like you provide a series of facts and reason and logical arguments and whatnot, and then leftists turn around and are like, oh, wow, it seems to stand in direct contravention of my previous beliefs, so I should hold new beliefs. It's not the way they operate, you know? They're just like, oh, capitalism, weight male heteronormativity, we have to stop cisgendered people, die, cis scum. This is where their brains go, because they're parasites. Uh, one of our commenters wants to know your thoughts on the upcoming debate between Adam Kokesh and Augustus Invictus on November 28th. And for those viewing, that's actually going to be streamed right here on Liberty Hangout. Well, you know what? I look forward to that uh, being done and then somebody editing out everything Kokesh said. And I'll just listen to fucking Augustus speak for a little while. Um, <laughs> I think I, I, I used to um, I, I've worked with Adam quite a bit over the years and I, and I really uh, used to like him a lot. Uh, over the over the last few years, it seems to me that he has just decided to jump in wholeheartedly with this whole entire leftward downward spiral of uh, like hippy dippy nonsense and drugs, and that is uh, that is dramatically unfortunate because I, I think that he had a, a a great deal of potential and to be I think he's uh, came to reason a little bit after he got attacked and berated by Black yeah, Lives Matter a year ago. Lynching. Yeah, that too. But I mean, when you said when he got attacked by the Black Lives Matter people, was that it? Yeah, a year ago. Did you see? Did you see the 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 um the outro to that video? He sits there and he says, "I'm aware of my privilege. I'm just trying to get along." Like that is nonsense. <laughs> that is complete horseshit. That I, I couldn't even believe it was coming out of his mouth. I'm like, you just got attacked by these fucking social justice warrior animals in the streets that are going after your mother for fuck's sake. You know, stop trying to capitulate to them. What are you doing? You know, you're gonna bow down to your fucking rival. Stop it. It's it's it, emasculine. You know. 
And I got I got fucking furious about that. And then over, over the time, you know, I had him talking on and it, uh, on my show. He's talking about fucking what is it? You know, nonviolent communication, all this hippie PC fucking faggotry. And I'm like, look, this is not going to be solved this way. All right. You got to fucking snap people out of their shit. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Augustus Invictus, um, have you heard of his recent project that he's been undertaking? I've heard of the Invictus War Room. I really don't know much about it, though, honestly. Um, yeah, it's something I'm a part of. It's essentially um, if a network of people, if shit hit the fan, basically, um, there'd be, you know, survival training, um, you know, basically all these intros um, or all these uh what do you say tutorials on how you could do different stuff like you know gun videos that sort of thing um and it's you know also a network of people that would keep in contact if if anything uh you know less than desirable were to happen here's here's two things that i want to say about that and i'm and i'm a big fan of augustus invictus so augustus if you're listening this is just some constructive criticism i hope i haven't i haven't voiced this to him privately um i think that if you're going to do something like that and you're going to try to make it of the consequence that you're you're describing it as then branding it with your own name is a really terrible idea because it sounds like you're you're putting a, a brand name on it that that serves the benefit of that brand and and so if I decided to Christopher Cantwell's Revolutionary Network or something like that and like hey, here's a bunch of information and by the way give me your fucking home address and telephone number and social security I don't think he's asking for all that information from people you get the idea though um, everybody sign up for my my plan to violently overthrow the government of the United States and uh, and you know put your information here. It doesn't sound like the the, the soundest of uh, of ideas in my book, and so I didn't bother with it. It's it's probably a great thing. It's probably organized a lot better than I'm thinking of it, and I'm and I'm making just assumptions from what I'm looking at uh, outwardly. But that's where it went through my head. Isn't it just called the War Room, not the Invictus War Room? It's it is the Invictus War Room, but we we refer to it as the War Room. Justin, you're actually in the group. Yeah, I I always thought it was yeah. just called the War Room. I thought the Invictus War Room was just yeah. the title of the Facebook group. <laughs> well, that's 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 the uh, that's the website name is InvictusWarRoom dot com. Now, just as kind of uh, one of our last closing questions here before we wrap up here, since we've been on for probably about an hour, um, who would Christopher Cantwell recommend that viewers um, subscribe to their podcasts besides yours, and um, what what books would you recommend they read? Well, I, if if you are not already a religious uh, subscriber to uh, Stefan Molyneux and Tom Woods, and I would certainly suggest that you do that, I'd even go so far as to suggest that um, once once you're done paying me, that you uh, donate to these gentlemen. I think that they're two of the best things that were ever produced in the history of mankind. Um, I would say book-wise, I'll give you two book recommendations that I've already mentioned during the course of this interview. Uh, Democracy, the God That Failed by Hans Hermann Hoppe and The Evolutionary Psychology Behind Politics uh, – uh, by anonymous conservative. Those two books are excellent reads that will shatter a lot of worldviews. Hmm. I actually remember that last year when we were chatting with you, we asked you who the biggest influences were in your libertarian thinking. Um, but one thing I want to ask now was who was kind of the biggest influences a year ago to try to get you down the path to right wing populism? Who kind of made you reassess your thought system there? That's um, it's a complicated question, actually, because it was a series of events. It was not a person. It was um, uh, you guys might have heard there was a video where I had to pull a gun out on some people in Keene, New Hampshire, and the, and the police came and like really it scared, scared the living hell out of me. And also put me into a, a conversation with my local police department that allowed me to have a good relationship with them. And that was a, a life changing moment. Um, there was uh, I. In, you know, I live in New Hampshire, which is home to the Free State Project, this political migration of libertarians trying to take over and dismantle the government of New Hampshire. Now, in, in, the, in the Free State Project, you have this same leftist infiltration problem that we've been talking about, the, the, the greater libertarian movement. And one of the things that's become very common here is uh, polyamory, uh, this idea that you can, you know, a bunch of other guys are going to fuck your girlfriend and that's not going to create some conflict. Right. And that I've, I've watched that happen in a bunch of times. I've seen what it does to. The men, I've seen what it does, especially to the women, and I found out to be like horribly destructive. And I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm getting to a point where I am uncomfortable with the casual attitudes that people have towards sex and vice and that sort of thing. And that's sort of what has compelled this. So it was more or less your uh, just kind of uh, seeing what was going on in the culture around you that kind of convinced you. Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong. Like Molyneux was influential, right? And I mean, Tom Woods has always been a, shall we say, a right of center guy, um, and and. You know that those I I events coming into coming into the fruition like around the same time as the immigration discussion and all these other things just and I've been and as you guys are aware I've been fighting with leftists in the libertarian movement for years and so 
all of those things just sort of coming together in this same six months to a year time frame put me politically right of Genghis Khan, right? And I'm like, I don't give a fuck about your democracy anymore. We got to solve some problems. <laughs> Chris, did you have any last questions for Mr. Cantwell? No, I think this has been really informative and um, I look forward to watching his podcast in the future. And I also, um, I think uh, before you go, would you like to tell us about your new uh, mini series you're doing radical relationships for those who might not know about it? All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. Now I have, um, Obviously, I've been doing uh, Radical Agenda for a bit over a year now, Then we've been doing some garbage podcasts before that. And it has come up a few times, uh, and if you want to see like a, a de- a, an example of the detail, there's a video on my YouTube channel titled Radical Relationships Preview, where I took a couple of calls where I was talking about something. I, had, I, I went through a few things in my own personal life recently that, that I, I allowed to go out onto the air with the, uh, with the permission of people involved. Um, and these were really, um, in my opinion... Uh, very interesting and very fucked up stories, right? I have a, I have a, I have a unique uh, life. I have a, I have a different existence than most people, and so that uh, makes for very interesting things in the uh, in a love life from time to time. But I'm sort of sharing these things in the hopes that other people will start calling in with their stuff. Now, uh, I'm not push- pushing it out there as a, um, as an advice show because. Uh, you know, but frankly, that that would be ridiculous. That'd be like a fat guy selling diet books. But uh, I I think that I'm capable of offering uh, a different perspective than people are used to in their uh, in their relationship discussions. And so I think at the very least it'll be very entertaining. And so I hope you'll all check it out. All right, awesome, all right. very cool stuff. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, uh, Mr. Cantwell. It was a great pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for having me on. I had a blast, guys. Anytime. And thank you guys so much for tuning into the Liberty Hangout podcast. Uh, make sure you go check out Christopher Cantwell's site, ChristopherCantwell.com. Check out his podcast, Radical Agenda. Um, can't follow him on Twitter anymore. He's banned on there, but go check out his Facebook page. And make sure you check out LibertyHangout.org to read some awesome Liberty-minded material from a great lineup of writers. And check out LibertyHangout.org slash store to get some really cool mer- merchandise, such as this taxation is theft hat. They're selling like crazy right now, so make sure you go and get yours before they're all out. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we will see you again next time.